Hello, and welcome to another episode of Managing Through Crisis, where Harvard Business School faculty share their insights on how to manage in challenging times. We started this series in 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic, which we all know were unprecedented times for managers. And we've learned since then that crises are pretty much a constant in business. So we've continued to post episodes on things like supply chain and other things that have happened in the business world. And today we're really thrilled to be speaking with Professor John Quelch, who has just rejoined the HBS faculty after serving as Vice Provost at the University of Miami and Dean of Miami Business School. And he's here to talk about marketing in a downturn, which is actually the title of an article he published in Harvard Business Review way back in 2009 during the Great Recession. Today we're going to revisit some of the ideas in that article to see how they apply to the current recessionary environment when John thanks so much for joining me today my pleasure Brian uh, great to have you here and great to have you back at HBS it's it's great to see you around campus so uh, so that's really that's really terrific uh, why don't we just start by taking a look back at the environment in 2009 when you wrote that original article what were what were leaders dealing with at that time uh, it was a much more serious situation, Brian. The uh, GDP had fallen 4.3% from its peak in the fourth quarter of 2007 uh, over an 18-month period ending in the second quarter of 2009. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, uh, unemployment, uh, which had been uh, around about 5% in December 2007, had risen to 10% by October 2009. Uh, so it was not called the Great Recession for no good reason. Yeah. Uh, what we're seeing today is something that is, uh, uh, in a sense, much less serious, but also different in the sense that um, it was preceded by the COVID experience, which, of course, uh, was very disruptive in many respects, uh, not least to uh, consumer buying patterns. Yeah, and consumers have obviously gone through so much uh, in so many different ways over the last four years that just this feels like a continuation of a, a stressed environment. Your first article talked about consumer psychology and what marketers needed to think about in that regard. Probably uh, consumer psychology might be a little bit different today, but just talk about that a little bit and what that would look like in this in this environment. Uh, so what we did in uh, 2009 was took a look at various consumer segments. Um, and divided uh, essentially the population by uh, the uh, speed and uh, um, uh, strength of the response that uh, different consumer segments took to uh, the crisis. Uh, so uh, some people, when confronted with the Great Recession, uh, were in a what we called slam on the brakes category. Uh, in other words, they, they simply uh, stopped all discretionary spending almost uh, overnight. Uh, they may have lost their job. They may have lost their home uh, to foreclosure. Um, so there was a, a sense of urgency that gripped a significant portion of the uh, population. Mm -hmm. um, at the other end of the spectrum, though, just as today, uh, there would be a, a calm and comfortable uh, upper 10 percent of the population uh, who manage through uh, these kinds of downturns and have the uh, the savings uh, back up in order to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, we know that the job loss factor is not nearly as significant this time around. So people are still taking in paychecks. They're still making purchases. But but how are they prioritizing those purchases? How do, how do consumers think about what they're going to spend money on? Well, I think many of the uh, people in the audience will remember the Maslow hierarchy of needs, and uh, um, that, in uh, in a way, is a fairly simplistic approach to answering your question. But uh, food and shelter obviously do uh, loom prominently in these mm -hmm. kinds of circumstances, and what we find is that, uh, of course, necessary items continue to be purchased. Um, fortunately for most people uh, interacting with others, uh, people do not stop buying toothpaste when there's a downturn. <laughs> Thank uh, goodness. But, um, they, will, um, they will downsize um, uh, their vacation aspirations. Uh, they will uh, eat out less and eat at home more. Uh, they will uh, be more coupon and promotion conscious when making day-to-day uh, -day purchases, and they might put off the purchase of uh, a new vehicle uh, and continue holding on to a used vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so there are all of these many well-established, uh, tried and true and predictable approaches that certain uh, portions of the population will under uh, out of necessity or perhaps out of uh, fear and caution uh, take in order to cope with the uh, the crisis. Yeah. So so we've talked about consumers in this kind of an environment. Let's turn to the firm now. You know, uh, the typical reaction that you see oftentimes in these situations is let's cut and slash and control spending. If you're a CMO in this environment, what kind of argument can you make to your CEO about why the marketing budget should not be on the cutting block? Uh, especially if you have um, uh, products that have been accelerating in their uh, market adoption rates, um, you don't want to uh, pull the uh, rug out from under these products um, in the face of a, a, a recession unless they happen to be uh, in this expendable category. So, for example, uh, you may have a fantastic uh, new cruise itinerary planned, but if you're Royal Caribbean in the midst of COVID, you're not going to go out and spend a lot of money on marketing that. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, with some obvious exceptions, what I uh, always suggest to people is look at the strength of your uh, product portfolio. And if it's strong, and if indeed, even if there are new products that you are still interested in launching during the recession, uh, go ahead and do so. But make sure that your messaging is pitched on a uh, value proposition basis rather than a luxury indulgence type pitch. Yeah. Um, in addition, I would say that with respect to cutting the marketing budget, if everybody around you is cutting and you have enough cash in the bank to stay the course, uh, your share of voice in the marketplace will, of course, increase uh, even if you just maintain your expected level of expenditure. So your opportunity to uh, improve your uh, unaided brand awareness, to potentially pick up more trial sales and uh, more uh, market share that could endure beyond the recession, um, all of those things can be magnified and the ROI on your uh, existing marketing budget can be magnified as well if you just stay the course with the current uh, uh, plan. Yeah, so it sounds like it could also be a time maybe to be opportunistic if you have some excess cash, let's say, and you're looking for new opportunities. Is this an opportunity to maybe double down on some areas, some strategic, strategically important areas? Well, one, one thing we find, Brian, is that, curiously enough, uh, family businesses, large-scale family businesses that are well-run, uh, that are not subject to uh, short-term quarterly pressures from the stock market, uh, these companies take a long view and frequently will invest significant cash in the acquisition of uh, weaker rivals mm -hmm. uh, who get upended by the recession, uh, get in a cash crunch, don't have the ability to uh, sustain themselves and uh, uh, need to get out. And uh, particularly um, private companies uh, have the ability during a recession to uh, double down on picking up uh, valuable market share and uh, market access through uh, customers that uh, uh, may be held by other companies that simply fail during the recession. Yeah. What are some things that CMOs should be cautious about? What are the, what are the perils involved in, in uh, this kind of environment? Well, the number one peril is always the chief financial officer. Um, <laughs> uh, that that is the 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 principal uh, bane of existence of every chief marketing officer. Uh, yes, I concur, and, 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 and rightly so, and rightly so. Uh, but you know, you have to have uh, evidence based arguments, and obviously, the chief marketing officer who has been uh, winging it uh, as an empty suit, promising. Uh, promising the earth, but, uh, you know, maybe in a recession, not particularly able to deliver, mm -hmm. you know, that person is going to be upended, whereas a more data-based um, chief marketing officer who can generate the uh, the evidence. Uh, and with uh, digital marketing these days, a lot of 
real-time evidence can be generated from testing different marketing tactics on a on a daily or weekly basis in the marketplace so there's no shortage of opportunity with digital marketing to gather uh, evidence that can support uh, a pivot to tactics that are uh, particularly appropriate uh, in the uh, changed environment yeah. What are some of the things that you think CMO should be measuring? We, you know, I think digital native firms like Netflix and other firms that are sort of born in the digital space, it seems pretty obvious the kind of analytics that they can look at. But if you're a mature firm, if you're a P&G or somebody else out there, what are the kinds of things that you can measure that would show the sort of hardcore evidence that you need to make a compelling argument to the CFO? Uh, so I think certainly uh, social media traffic and engagement is something that uh, has come into play significantly in the last 10 years for uh, uh, fast moving consumer goods companies. But um, I think you still kind of get away from uh, the reality that um, brand unaided brand awareness uh, is a really important precursor uh, to trial and to uh, market share. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, the um, the hierarchy of effects, if you like, that stem from, uh, first of all, getting recognition, then through awareness, through preference, through liking, through trial, through uh, repeat, through loyalty, um, that that sequence still holds true uh, even today and even as we are uh, using and leveraging digital media much more uh, alongside traditional media to generate these effects among consumers. Mm -hmm. So uh, this has been a great conversation, John. I have one more question. I actually feel optimistic now after hearing you talk about this. I think there's a tendency for you know people to think about doom and gloom in situations like this, but it sounds like there's real opportunity here in the marketing function to be able to thrive in an environment like this. What's one thing uh, you want people to remember uh, as they're thinking about how to move forward in a recessionary environment? Uh, number one is exactly what you said, Brian, because um, it is the moral obligation of every chief marketing officer to remain optimistic in the face of disaster. Um, <laughs> you know, just uh, think think about the guys playing the violin on the Titanic as it went down. I mean, those guys were classic sales guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, seriously, you know, one thing to remember is there's a lot of room for innovation during a recession. People are uh, laid off, as we've seen in California, I'm sure. All of those folks who've been laid off in Silicon Valley are going to spawn uh, dozens, if not hundreds of new companies uh, as a result of uh, being given the opportunity to do so by being let go uh, from Meta or whatever company they were working for before. And we shouldn't forget that uh, Microsoft was founded during a downturn, uh, Vanguard, mutual funds, uh, Jack Bogle founded during a downturn. Um, there is uh, no end of companies that were founded uh, during downturns as a result of people questioning uh, whether or not the economics of the existing delivery systems for services to consumers were uh, necessarily the be all and end all. And obviously, creative juices were ignited during these downturns, and the US economy benefited enormously from the entrepreneurship that flowed from the folks who uh, uh, looked in the mirror and saw some new vision of how things could be done. That's great. John, thank you so much for joining me on Managing Through Crisis. Very good. Thank you, Brian. I think I'm going to take up violin. And by the way, for, for, for uh, those viewers, if you want to look up the article that we were referencing, it's actually a 2009 article. It still holds up really well today. So you can find that on HBR. And uh, uh, John, we'll see you soon. Thank you.